Okay. So, what is, where does all this lead? Does it mean I want to turn the clock back? I think we should turn the clock back. It's something they throw at you if you make the kind of arguments that I'm making today. No, I don't want to turn the clock back. I've recognized all along that the pre-fed system was a lousy system. Of course we don't want to go back to it. But the fact that it was a lousy system means two things. First, it means we don't want to go back to it. It also means that if we have a system now that's been doing even worse, we don't want to keep that, right? So we need something that's not the old system and that's not the current system. What could that be? Well, if you go back to the old system and really look into why it was lousy, you find something very interesting. The lousiness of the prefed system wasn't due to our lacking a central bank. It was due to other financial restrictions peculiar to the U.S. currency system at the time. And we can see this quite clearly if we look at our northern neighbor, Canada. Remember, the Fed was established to set up to have an elastic currency while maintaining the gold standard. Here's a chart showing what happens to this, what was happening in the 19th century, the last couple decades, in the early 20th, to the supply of national bank note currency, which was our paper currency, and Canadian currency. The scales are different, you can't see them here, but Canada multiply, multiply Canada by 10, Canada by 10 you have the US. So the national bank notes, look, the country's supposed to be growing, and it is growing, the supply is shrinking, 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 right? And then the other thing is, then start, they make some reforms, it gets a little better, but the other thing is there's no seasonal adjustment. Every year in those days, in Canada and the U.S., there's a peak seasonal demand for currency connected with moving the crops, where you have to pay migrant workers, they don't keep checking accounts, and so on. Very few people, by the way, kept checking accounts back then. So, now you look at this other line for Canada, and look, currency supply, it's growing slowly, secularly, right? And lovely spike every autumn, just where you think it should be if it's if supply is following demand. Oh, they must have a central bank doing their great job, you know, right, right? This just just on top of things we can't. No, they don't. Wait a minute, they can't have this unregulated system in like the US. No, they don't have an unregulated system like the US. They really have an unregulated system. We don't. We have a economy where national banks can only issue notes subject to a more than 100 percent backing requirement for the bank has to consist of government bonds. Right? So guess what happens? Starting after World War, after the Civil War, the U.S. government's retiring its debt. Now, think of what happens to the currency supply. If the government retires all its bonds, what is the maximum stock of national currency that's available to the economy? Zero. Zero. So, retire the debt. Sounds great. Oops, no currency. Right? That's not a good system. Why do they have that system? Because during the Civil War, they needed a way to boost the demand for government bonds. So they created the national banks and said, okay, you can only issue currency if you buy our bonds. Right? So it's all fiscal. So this regulation created for wartime finance becomes a, a, a source of tremendous problem. Also with that arrangement, there's other details I won't go into, you can't have any short-term adjustments in the currency supply because the bond deposit rules make it uneconomical to engage in such adjustments. So Canada, what do they have? They have a system of competing banks of issue. It's, it's, it's much concentrated. It starts with about 40 or 50 and eventually goes down this, uh, you know, uh, a, couple, a dozen by the third. Uh, so there's not free entry, but these banks, though, can branch nationwide, which U.S. banks can't. So they're strong and diversified. That's the other thing our system lacks. Our banks were not allowed to branch, with few exceptions, until recently, until the 90s. So uh, the behavior of the currency supply you see in Canada is the result of unregulated, largely unregulated competitive competition between these competing banks of issue. And the Canadian system is notoriously crisis free. Notoriously crisis free. You need to read a newspaper from back then. The currency question, how Canada has solved it with fair success. Sounds like some recent headlines about Canada during the subprime crisis. Okay. Much flexibility secured. Circulation rises in crop demand. Well, you can read it. In the Great Depression, before Canada set up a central bank, how many banks failed in Canada? Here's the answer. 5,000 US banks failed in the first, uh, from 1929 to 1933. These are some of the Canadian bankers. So, there was an alternative arrangement that really would have solved the problems. It wasn't a central bank arrangement. 
Today, we can't replicate exactly that kind of system. One thing that's gone may be difficult to replace ever again is the gold standard. Getting that back is very hard. But the point is there are alternatives and we should be talking about them right now because right now we have a system that's as bad as any system this country's ever had. Thank you very much.